Meine Damen und Herren, Senoras y Señores, Ladies and Gentlemen, in behalf of the, uh, Mr. Rafael Calventi, Ambassador of the Dominican Republic in Germany and of the Embassy, I'd like to express my appreciation for this invitation to participate in this meeting about uh, cultural tourism in Latin America and the Caribbean. I'd like to take advantage of this opportunity to share with you today some of the thought of his thought about the historical importance of Hispaniola, of the Hispaniola Island, uh, during the time of the discovery of America. And there is a reason for that. Many important monuments from that period remain today in the Hispaniola Island and are an important attraction to visitors from all over the world. This Caribbean island is divided in two different countries with different political administrations and distinctive cultures. On the east, there is the Republic of Haiti, and in the west is the Dominican Republic, where I am from. I hope these discussions will expand the knowledge of the Spanish-speaking side of the island and its relationship with Europe and the rest of America. From the moment in which Christoph Christopher Columbus set foot on the land on the Hispaniola island in 1492, millions of pages have been written and there have been thousands and thousands of documents to study the important event of the discovery. The thing is that the Hispaniola played a very important role in that time and will help us to understand um, the Western world as it is now and as we know it today. Uh, Travelers, history, scholars, and intellectuals still have much to say and to contribute to the understanding of that encounter of two worlds five centuries ago. It was not a simple conquest, as one uh, may have been interpreted, but a real melting pot of cultures in the broadest sense of the word. Uh, this uh, conference today uh, aims to provide insights into the adventures of Christoph Christopher Columbus and contribute to a more accurate vision and interpretation of historical processes that led to what we are today as a Western civilization. I'd like to join, uh, to join me and make some discoveries about this. Please note that... The, Uh, Spain founded its right to the occupation of the lands discovered in the New World by a special bula. I don't know how is it, uh, what is the word in English for bula? It's like an authorization from the Pope. It was a concession made by the Pope, which uh, was a document issued in favor of Spain, of Spain by Pope Alexander Uh, six on May 4th, 1493. That means months after the discovery began uh, by Columbus. And they gave, it, gave him immediately the right to, to uh, take possession of the land. So not even a year after the the Columbus discovery, they already had some documents authorizing the possession of this land. And that occupation was not peaceful. Manuel Arturo Peña Valle, a Dominican historian, said that in very few places in America, colonization reached the extremes of cruelty and ferocity as occurred in our island. It was a fast extermination of the population and the indigenous institutions. 
So hard was that behavior of the Europeans on the island that in 1510th uh, had caused an angry protest of the Dominican missioners from the order of the Dominicans, no? Who arrived in Hispaniola in 1494, so only two years after the discovery. This systematic mistreatment and extermination of the indigenous population resulted in rejection and opposition of these religious uh, monks uh, from uh, Spain. One of them was Fray Anton de Montesinos. He was the first who fought uh, from the pulpit and exposed those abuses, and so he became the first fighter of human rights in the New World in 1511. When he pronounced in front of, the, of Don Diego Columbus his famous Sermon of Advientos, a genuine piece of protest against the, hum the inhuman power of the colonizers. Indian mistreatment led to the first rebellion of or uprising, the first guerrilla war in America. These desperate actions was carried out by Enriquillo, an Indian brave and bold, educated in the Spanish style, who kept the island in a state of war in an unequal struggle for 13 years. The first rebel, uh, rebel and revolution in America became one of the biggest concerns of the Holy Roman Empire, led by Charles V. Charles uh, V, or Carlos V, intervened in this conflict in 1533. And I mention him because he was proclaimed Holy Roman Emperor here in Germany in the Roman city of Trier, whose electors had much to do with his coronation as a Holy Roman Emperor. And it was Charles V who authorized the Dutch and the Portuguese to do trade of slaves in America. Millions of Africans were abducted from their homes in Africa and sold into an unknown land to work as prisoners and slaves. This happened almost a hundred years before England intervened in that immoral, immoral but profitable business of uh, human trafficking. Carlos V, or Charles V, abolished then the parcel system, which was before another form of exploitation of the Indians, but at the same time led to the enslavement of black Africans in America an economic system that the, the colonists exper, uh, exerted and even uh, more ruthless, more uh, very uh, aggressive. No? This brutal behavior of the conquerors caused in Hispaniola the first re rebellion, the first rebellions of blacks in America in 1522. And so today historians, both of Hispaniola and of the city of Santo Domingo, are endless source of study to understand the meaning of the conquest of America. But not everything is negative. History also records and reveals an undeniable fact of exchange and progress. One of those things was the understanding of the shape of and the size of the earth. And it is very interesting to know that were Germans who first used the name America to refer to the newly discovered continent. The cartographers Martin Walzemüller and Matthias Rigman, here in Germany, created the first Mapamundis based on the epistolary exchange with Americo Vespucci. And that's why it's called America, because of Americo Vespucci. Here, universities were eagerly studying the maps that came from America. The Germans, Johannes Kepler, a cosmographer, made from those documents also a most accurate configuration of the planet 
uh, at that point. At that point, five years, five hundred years ago, uh, the idea uh, that the man had of himself and of the earth was completely different. So the European culture, once arriving in Hispaniola, not only expands across America from our tiny Caribbean island, but return, returns to its original source, Spain, and is enriched in Europe, transforming the conception that man had of himself and having a better understanding of the world. That is how America enriches the language, literature, cuisine, and as many other uh, aspects of, and enriches many other aspects of uh, European life. Inversely, on the other way, uh, settlers, uh, the settlers from Europe, destroyed or radically transformed the lives and the culture of the, of the Indians. For example, the commander Nicolás de Ovando from Spain traced cities in a very uh, geometrical way. Uh, using primarily the grid, la quadricula, no? starting a new conception of urbanism and architecture in America. Since the founding of La Isabela, the first European city of Hispaniola, the first city was uh, created by uh, Ovando was in 1494. But Ovando founded and developed it in the island of Hispaniola, 17 cities during his government. Hispaniola, and particularly the city of Santo Domingo, came to be very developed, and there was a lot of trade and experimentation with new crops. In fact, after the conquerors' incursion into other American territories, they returned to the island and brought in seeds, grain, fruits, and roots from the vast uh, territory of America, which has an enormous, tremendous flora, tremendous kind of, of all kind of crops. And from Santo Domingo port, it was shipped back to Europe, it was shipped to Europe as the fruit of their findings. And many of these uh, um, uh, articles or crops or uh, cultivos, no? They were, um, they are very important in the economy of the whole world. One of those is the potato, no? Which is uh, very important here in Germany, in Russia, everywhere. Uh, um, corn and uh, others, uh, uh, other kind of food, no? To organize the trade, there was a, in a, una casa de contrataciones of America. In, in, in already in 1503, there was a, a, a really kind of uh, a bolsa de valores, or uh, how do you say, uh, trade uh, stock market, or not a stock market was, a, but they were like dealing with buying and selling to. The whole world. It, it was in 1503. And um, the colonial city of Santo Domingo became so uh, interesting no? and so uh, full of life in that time, in 1503, that the UNESCO proclaimed it a, a um, heritage of international heritage of the humankind. The Hispaniola. In Hispaniola, plants were received from Europe as well. So we received plants in, in, uh, in, in Hispaniola first, and then from there, they spread out to the whole New World. Uh, and they were cultivated in the uh, fertile territory of America. For example, in 1504, the Spanish settler Pedro de Atienza brought sugar cane to the island. A few years after discovery, in 1515, was already working the first mills, uh, mill of sugar or trapiche, uh, a sugar mill, located in what is now the Dominican Republic. And in 1550, 
The sugar industry had achieved a remarkable development, both in our island and in the neighboring Cuba, but also in Brazil. And Brazil became very important in the sugar business at the time, but it was first brought to Santo Domingo. The bananas uh, were brought also to Santo Domingo for uh, Bartolomé de Berlanga, Fray Bartolomé de Berlanga. He was a, a, a priest. And he first planted them in Hispaniola, and then with new strains led to Mexico and Panama, and its cultivation spread out through all Central America. Later, Berlanga, a domi uh, he was from the Dominicus, the Dominicus monk, became bishop in Panama, but the history remembers him for his bananas. And the history, and usually they call this, all these countries around uh, Central America like banana republics, in a despective way, of course. I want uh, to emphasize that long before it was founded in Santo Domingo, the first university uh, in America, which was in 1538, uh, La Universidad de Santo Domingo, from there, uh, from the very beginning of the 16th century, the city of Santo Domingo was in itself a kind of living university, an authentic school of navigators and discoverers because it was there where the sailors were initiated uh, with his profitable professions. So they were formed there, and from there they discover other countries. For example, uh, there is the case of Alonso de Ojeda, who was living in, uh, in Santo Domingo, and then he went and discovered Guyana, Venezuela, Trinidad, Tobago, Curaçao. Aruba and Colombia, parts of Colombia. And Diego Velázquez discovered Cuba in 1493. Pedro Alonso Niño, who was also living in Santo Domingo, uh, discovered the Margarita Island and uh, the root of the pearls in Venezuela. Vicente Yañez Pinzón uh, from the island, uh, was living in the island as well, and he went out and discovered Brazil and the Amazon in uh, 1500. Francisco Pizarro arrived in Hispaniola in 1502 and 1509 and participated in expeditions uh, uh, and discovered that part of Puerto Rico and Florida. And Alvar Núñez Cabeza de Vaca went out of the Hispaniola and discovered the Gulf of Mexico. And was also uh, Hernán Cortés was living in Santo Domingo. He had a, problems a problem because he fell in love with a, with a woman of another man, and he had to run from the island with his men. And he discovered Mexico. <laughs> so there is in Santo Domingo a lot of interesting buildings and architecture from that time that shows the prosperity of the city. By the way, the Dominican uh, government now is investing $75 million uh, in restoring uh, a lot of those buildings in the colonial zone. And the colonial zone is looking, is already, this is work, uh, work in progress, so it's looking very good ra right now. And uh, traditionally, there is uh, the Alcázar of Columbus that is very visited, and many other interesting buildings. We had the first hospital, for example. The first hospital in America was built in 1503. And it was, was there also the first, uh, I don't know how to say this in English, manicomio or house of, how do you say, who helps me? What? Oh, uh, yeah. It was a uh, psychiatric hospital. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, it was uh, there, the first one, the first uh, hospital, and still the, the, there is a convent, and the, the priest used to take care of the people that had problems uh, in their heads. And... Uh, uh, 
it was uh, a prison on a, on a side, uh, a psychiatric hospital and a hospital, uh, a general hospital. And there were so many, uh, so many interesting things. For example, in front of these uh, ruinas of San Francisco, because it's, that's the, called San, uh, San Francisco de Assis, um, in front of it, every week, every Sunday afternoon, there is a big cultural, there is a cultural event that is free for everybody, paid by the city of, of Santo Domingo, which is one of our musical uh, uh, groups and uh, one of our musical uh, uh, genres that is called Son. So everybody's dancing on the street in front of these old uh, ruins, and it's very interesting to see this. So if you have a chance to come to the Dominican uh, Republic, don't miss that in the ruins of San Francisco. Uh, there is still much to investigate, uh, to investigate on the land from which all started in America, the island of, of Hispaniola now largely occupied by the Dominican Republic, which, uh, despite of the smallness, contributed much to the old world during the time of the conquest. And um, the Dominican uh, culture, which is uh, uh, the subject uh, of, of this uh, uh, historical and cultural aspect, it's very interesting, too, because it's a melting pot. We have, in our music, a lot of influence from Africa, a lot of influence from Spain, and still we have influence from the Indians uh, that used to live there. So it's a, it's a very interesting music. Uh, uh, there is different, many, many ways of expressing it musically. But also, in terms of art, we have been in uh, painting and uh, uh, fine arts. We have been uh, had we have had a lot of influences from different countries. The first one was from Spain, of course. And Spain, they came and they, they built the first cathedral in America. But there came painters to paint and to work the wood and to be to make sculptures from Spain. We had a wonderful wood called mahogany. And in this, with this mahogany, they built a lot of uh, sculptures, and still they are till the day of today. So, um, after the world, the Second World, no, no, the, not the Second World War, but the uh, war in Spain, there was a, a huge amount of artists and intellectuals that came to the island of the Dominican Republic. And these uh, artists were mostly from Spain, but others were from uh, Jewish origin or Germans or whoever. And they established, the first one to establish uh, the National School of Arts was Manolo Pascual. And Manolo Pascual uh, and his group of artists from Spain they really uh, made uh, a big difference with our art and the art of the rest of the countries. So, for example, I am a result of that school. And uh, because uh, he, um, he was a very inspiring man, I met him, was a wonderful uh, master. And I would like to show you yeah, whenever it's possible, I see Elvira is uh, running away. <laughs> uh, I'd like to show you some of my own work as an artist, as a painter, so that you see uh, maybe the level that we have reached thanks to the help and to the mastership of some of uh, these uh, artists that came uh, to the Dominican Republic at the end of the Civil War in, in Spain. Uh, um, I was um, I, I was uh, studying in in Santo Domingo, and uh, I came very early to to Spain to study. And when the masters here in uh, Madrid they saw my work, they said, "Oh, you have you don't need to be 
uh, drawing from sculptures, you can go directly now to work with uh, live models. And I started painting, and there was, um, I wrote a letter to Don Gregorio Marañón, who was a very famous uh, intellectual doctor and very respect, uh, a respected person who was the president of what they had before as Instituto de Cultura Hispánica, Institute of Spanish Culture. And um, let me see. And um, when he saw my work, he said, you have a lot of influence from Italy. I stayed quiet because I was, I, I was not, I, I didn't go to Italy at the time, so I, and I said, oh, really? And he asked uh, somebody uh, from the Institute to look at my work, and they uh, provided the opportunity for me, which I appreciate a lot, to exhibit in those cities you mentioned, which were Malaga, the Museum of Fine Arts in Malaga, the Instituto de Cultura Hispánica in Madrid is moving. Oh, good. And uh, it was, it, it, at the beginning, my work was very classic, very figurative, and mostly about uh, the human body. But these paintings that you're looking at now, uh, I don't think the color is very faithful, but anyways, uh, they are called Organica series. They are forms shaped uh, in the shape of nature. Oof. Sorry. Um, so uh, they were um, uh, forms that are inspired always by nature and that has a always a, uh, uh, curve, curved li lines, never straight line. Uh, can we, where do we do here? Ah, so here you see. Oh, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> okay. Um, always uh, shapes taken from nature and transformed into something living. Let me see now the next one. This is also very vegetable, some ve ve uh, inspired in, in nature. Because we have in, the, in Santo Domingo a very, uh, oh, here is a figurative piece. Uh, very academic. Let me see what we have more, because I don't really know what is in this. Uh, I like to study uh, the human face and uh, the human anatomy in general. And I'm very interested in the different si um, forms. This Can is you give us dates on your pictures so we see evolution? Uh, I don't believe in evolution. <laughs> uh, Progress is simply to change, uh, to move. Uh, used to say the uh, Nietzsche that when you talk about progress, you talk about movement. So things move. For example, uh, the paintings made in the caves of uh, Altamira, for example, to mention a, a place in Spain, or Ajanta in India. This, this. Uh, forms these uh, drawings on the on the caves uh, were as modern as Picasso, you know, at that time. So there is no time for art. Is uh, I work a lot with the human uh, form. Ah, okay. And always the the position or the 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 woman seen as a powerful uh, being. Uh, and as a goddess many times. I think uh, wi uh, women are wise, they have a lot of wisdom and a lot of power. Sometimes they're not conscious about it and they don't use it, but they should. Uh, again, one of these, this is a, a piece from maybe 12 years ago. 
and this also. So here you have had uh, a little bit of the figurative work, more figurative and more another one of the organic forms. Um, any questions? Any more? I could, I could. If I get tired of one thing, <laughs> I could do the other. I have, I have worked in Berlin, a new series that is not here, that is also organic forms. It's going to be presented in Michigan at the University uh, and um, Ann Arbor, which is a very important uh, art school. The, the bowl. This it's like the wisdom of the women it represent or it's I, I like to paint this as, um, as in many, many of my paintings, also in abstract paintings it is. And uh, this correspond to a, an, um, a painting uh, called, to a series called Fortuna, Fortune. Mm -hmm. And there is this Fortune crystal transparent bowl. Uh, to see the future. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And I just observed that the women look a bit masculine sometimes. Yeah. The one? <laughs> they are a bit, uh, no, I mean not so, f they are feminine in, in the face, but in the um, body structure they are strong. Yeah. Well, sometimes I use models to work, and sometimes mostly of my models are usually dancers. Okay. And they are very developed in their muscles, and I like that. It's, uh, it gives you the sense of power, even when she is in a, not in an aggressive or, but the power is there, mm -hmm. and I like that. No, thank you. <laughs> I think all the pictures also show your early training with sculptures because all the forms, although they're two-dimensional, have a three-dimensional quality to them. Yes, it's a very, it's a very good observation. I, I really, I made uh, a series of sculptures after making a, a, a series of paintings like, uh, let me see, Yeah, like, like this one or this one, for example. I made a series of uh, sculptures made in uh, well clay and then bronze. And um, it's, it's, it's my major passion is the sculpture. It's uh, something that I really like. And color and is also in t important, but I, I transform myself when I do one thing or the other. Uh, then I don't, when I'm painting, I don't think about sculpture. When I'm writing, I don't think about painting, and uh, that's it. Any other question? Yes. Ah. I'd like to know if the paintings have different names, or you, whether you have names for the different pen paintings. Yes, they do. But... Uh, Put a name in a painting, uh, I think sometimes it directs too much the, atten the, the consciousness of the person who is looking at it. And I like that the, the title of a piece is only a suggestion, doesn't give you too much about the painting, because you as a beholder, you're going to have your own conclusions about it. You don't have to know uh, the whole history is uh, there is a, a, a lot of things that the painting gives you when you look at it or the artwork. And sometimes it doesn't, because sometimes you pass in front of a painting and it doesn't tell you anything, and you continue walking till you find one that attracts you for some reason, and you have a connection with the artist and with the work, and this is what is important. The title uh, is something that is necessary for catalogs, for things, but it's secondary. And you? Yeah, thank you for your presentation and for showing us your work. I wanted to ask you a bit more about your role as cultural attaché at the embassy, and especially how being an artist helps you or 
affects your work in the embassy? Well, uh, my work at the embassy is mostly with uh, with this uh, cultural thing. So I'm related to the other embassies and the other exhibitions that they present. And I organize, for example, the participation of Dominican Republic in festivals, like uh, when there is the Berlinale or the Frankfurt Fair, Book Fair. Uh, or now we're working on a, a Dominican uh, Cultural Week. So we do things related to art. So when I'm not working as an artist, I'm working in things related to it. So it's very enriching. When is this show of yours, if you don't mind sharing the dates, in Berlin and where? <laughs> I have the paintings done and I'm working now on the dates and on the place. So if you want, if you're interested in looking at my new series of paintings, I will gladly communicate with Elvira and uh, have some invitations for you to take a look at these uh, new paintings. Not only this, we are interested in that you consider the ICD as a place. Why not? It's a wonderful place. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to be so spontaneous. We can talk about it later. So any more questions? Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Lucas, and I have studied uh, architecture and uh, fine arts. So I'm interested in general about the artistic and cultural field. And especially what, what you're doing, I mean, this connection, let's say, between arts and this embassy or, let's say, this... And this? The, wor the work at the, as an ambassador or as a, in, at the embassy. My question is, let's say, in the art field, there is always this discussion of uh, identity, let's say. Or, as coming from Greece, let's say, all my studies, or at least at the beginning, we were we had to learn a lot about uh, Greek ancient uh, culture, tradition, and past. And because we are in Greece, and we have to learn about the let's say national identity or the national tradition. And then it comes the question: when you when someone tries to open his work to the world, let's say there are some questions that refer to this specific uh, let's say target group of the, the country or the state or the among people that share the same tradition. And then uh, is the other question of how uh, someone that comes from an area or a tra cultural tradition with a specific history, how can relate this work to the international field or to the international dialogue? Because, I mean, not only Greece, but also there are many other places that they deal with a specific past, but also they are trying to find a, a, a voice on the contemporary dialogue, let's say. And there is always an interesting uh, place in between, which is not always very clear, but it's always to try to find out what, which can be the, con the connection or the, the thing. So I, I don't have a specific question, let's say, but more <laughs> uh, it's always this question in my background, yes. how, how you deal I, I, with I a specific tradition that yes. you come from, yes. or also from the Dominican Republic and the history that the specific mm. place carries with the development of America and the relation to the Western world and all these things, but and also to the, let's say, current international uh, yeah. dialogue. I think I, think I, I understand what you are trying to say. and. Um, there has been a lot of efforts to restrict culture and to create maybe boundaries or uh, how do you uh, uh, muros, uh, walls, yes, and say everyone wants to say, well, this is mine and this is mine and this is yours and you're over there. But culture is very, is very difficult to do that because the influences of cultures are constantly, and uh, culture is very, um, it moves a lot. 
You know, it, um, in fact, in, in one same country, 10 years ago and today, you see a big difference in the same culture. So culture is now more open. There is more um, uh, influences from the media, the television, uh, movies, whatever. So there is a constant movement uh, from different directions. It's, it's not possible, not one man could hold a culture in one place. It has to move. But you mentioned something very important, tradition. I think tradition is very important. And it's important to use that tradition, but to improve on that tradition in a creative way. I have seen artists that say, oh, I, you know, I want to break down the tradition. There is no breakdown. The, the, it doesn't break. The tradition always, is always there. It always changes. But there is a line, invisible line, that connects us. When you see, for example, an artist like the German Josef Beuys, or which was a contemporary art, very important in his time, or others, they all, you, can, you can see Picasso, for example. But Picasso has a lot of connections with Africa, with uh, Asia at a certain moment, you know. And so he takes and he gives back. And this is what is art. This art we take, we, uh, we learn, but we return in, a, in our own personal way. And this is important in every field uh, of, of creation to understand the importance of what is there, the knowledge that there is there now. When I go to a museum, I learn a lot. I come inspired and I start working my own things. No, uh, but I, even when it has an influence, maybe you, I don't see it immediately. But then after a while, I see that that artist has particularly influenced in some way, somehow, my work. We are running a little bit out, out of time, so I think there's a very uh, last question. And so I will ask for a, l a short question and short answer, so we don't uh, okay. so much. I was just wondering if, as, as an ambassador and having been appointed in Canada, the United States, and Latin America, you've ever taken part in any project involving the promotion of indigenous arts and indigenous culture? No, yeah. I have not. Okay. <laughs> I have not indigenous. Uh, uh, in my country, there is a Taino uh, uh, indigenous culture, which is uh, very interesting. Um, but I think that was them, that was there. And uh, I admired, I, I love it. This is beautiful artwork. But I, you mean if I have, uh, but I understand this about my work or about promoting it? Because we don't have in Santo Domingo now indigenous communities. But I mean, uh, in Canada or the United States or. No. Or okay. I haven't had that experience, but I, I find it could be very, very interesting to do that. Well, this could go on forever because this dialogue is very interesting, but unfortunately, we have to stop here. Please, a big hand for the ambassador. Thank you so much for coming and sharing with us your paintings and your talk.